Sure. Okay. So are you saying the are you saying how you actually so the clock is being generated by the by the system phase lock loop? Yeah, but aren't we supposed to be sending a clock like at a different speed to the FPGA, this lab? Or no? Oh, you're saying for synchronizing the integrators. Yeah. Uh you can just use the the HPS to toggle a line, toggle an FPGA uh, line, and call that a clock. So the PIO would be, you would call the PIO import something integrator clock or something like that. Um, but it wouldn't be like a hardware. It wouldn't be like a hardware clock like some of the others that we've been considering, like that clock fifty line that I tied into mm. a few times. Okay. The reason you can get away with that is that, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the rate at which the H HPS is asking for updates is relatively slow. And so there's not clock edge race problems. And secondly, the cordis is cleverer than you think. And it may say, this person is using this line as a clock. I'm going to put it on the clock distribution network. Uh, and it may well do that, but it's slow and typically slow enough. If you have a 50 megahertz clock, you're crazy if you don't put it on the clock distribution network. But if it's a 100 kilohertz clock, eh, you know, what's a few nanoseconds of skew? And then in terms of triggering the reset, do you also do that from, you can do it from the HPS by just like triggering like the, the address line? Yeah. Okay. Well, that trigger, trigger an IO port line. It is, so it's not, it's not like the system reset. It's like, a, it's also a separate, like just generated reset. Yeah. Generate a, hook up a port and call it reset. Okay. I wasn't sure. Cause it was, cause on the, in the uh, QSYS, it was like a tied thing to like the system reset and the HPS reset. I wasn't sure if that was connected. Don't connect that. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, the, the system reset and the, and has to be connected to the PIO module, but the output of the PIO module into the FPGA, you can call anything you want, including reset. It does not appear on QSYS. It's not the QSYS reset. It's just a line, an output line you're calling reset. You're, you're essentially simulating buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the same way that you might hook up a, a, some external button or switch to implement reset logic, you're doing exactly the same thing. You're just sending that logic in through a PIO line. Okay. We can we'll talk more about it. Um, for folks that just joined, we were talking earlier, there was a question on Piazza about it is possible, I have to test this, it's possible that some of the examples on the course website require a particular version of Cordis that may or may not be installed on the lab PCs. Uh, I am gonna see whether or not that's the case. I need to go verify it after lecture today. Um, if it is the case, then we'll figure something out. Get the correct version installed or something, but we'll figure it out. Any other concerns before I get started or questions? My plan for today is to um, finish the PIO example that we were doing last time and then to add to that example a little bit. <clears throat> You'll recall that last time we were adding a PIO port to send information from the FPGA to the ARM. I want to augment that a little bit more to add a PIO port that goes from the arm to the FPGA. And then if we get through all that, I'll start, I'll start, I will start talking about some VGA stuff. Um, but frankly, I would, I would like to sort of take our time with the PIO examples and step through it pretty systematically and give people the opportunity to ask questions as we go, because it's kind of an important concept for all the subsequent labs. Um, so I, I want to just take our time with that. And if we get through it, fine. And if not, you know, if this is all we do today, then that's also fine. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And 
I will remind you first what we were working on last time um, before we ran out of time. We started with the PIO example from the course website. So we downloaded from the HPS to FPGA communication webpage. We downloaded this project and we were taking a look at that. Um, and we opened it up and looked at it and then we looked, took a look at the QSIS um, bus visualization and talked through this a bit and then added a new PIO port, parallel IO port to our bus design. We hooked this up to the system clock. We hooked this up to the system and HPS resets. And we connected our um, Avalon memory map slave input to the Axie master, which if we follow this line all the way up, this then goes into the Axie master for the arm. We could have alternatively hooked this up to the lightweight Axie master if we had wanted to put this on the lightweight bus. And perhaps when we add a new PIO port today, that's what we'll do just to show how that's done. But we, we, we hooked this up to the Axie master. And then we um, exported our external connection into Verilog by double clicking here and giving some name. And when we do this and then we click generate HDL, um, QSIS will, will, will um, instantiate a, a wire that we can tie our Verilog to so that we can manipulate our PIO port inside of our own Verilog. And then the last thing that we did was give our new PIO port um, an offset from the base address for um, the Axie Master bus that was not in conflict. That is to say, it, it did not overlap with anything else that was on that bus. So in our case, we put this between um, hex 20 and hex 2f offset from the um, hardware registers base. So that's where we were. And then we were starting to work on the HPS side of this. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to, we had looked at this a little bit. I want to just start from scratch with the C stuff because we were running out of time and felt a little rushed. So we'll just start that over. Um, I am just downloading from the same website the, the C code associated with this project. And I will, um, well, actually, let me put this somewhere where the syntax looks nicer. I'll put this here and change the syntax to C. Okay, so um, this is the, the HPS code associated with that example that does not yet include any information associated with our new PIO port. So that's what we want to add to this this C code first. Um, we talked about the, the PIO ports are placed at certain offsets from base addresses. So in, in our case, since we put our PIO port on the um, AXI bus, it is, it, it is addressed at some offset from that AXI bus. So in this case, the AXI bus base address is at hex C00000. This, this is non-negotiable. So these addresses are immutable and um, can be looked up in data sheets. The offsets from this base address are something that you control in QSIS. That's something that you, have, you do have power to change. Um, so we then have a series of pointers to memory addresses, which we will map to so the, these are virtual memory addresses that we will map to actual memory, which is accessible from the FPGA. Um, in our case, we want to add our PIO port to this list of pointers to memory addresses. So we'll add volatile unsigned int. Um, we'll call it my PIO read pointer. And I'm calling it a read pointer because we made this, PI, this particular PIO port an uh, input, which is to say output from the FPGA input to the ARM. So we're reading as opposed to writing. Um, this is all of the same sort of logic for the lightweight bus. We don't have to touch that because we're not putting anything on the lightweight bus. And then I want to define 
a new offset, offset from that Axie master base address where our new PIO port lives. So I'll, hit, I'll call this new PIO read. And this was at hex two zero. This offset must agree with in QSYS this offset, right? So it's this address that gives C a handle to grab onto in order to write to the same memory addresses that the FPGA is accessing. So this is, this is the critical link between QSYS and FPGA and C and memory mapping. So that's what we do here. We say our new PIO read address is going to be offset by hex two zero from the base address. Okay, and then we set this up. Um, we instantiate some file ID and then we do this thing that I can honestly not talk with too much depth about because I haven't really grokked this yet, but I'm working on it, which is we open memory as if it's a file. So this allows us to manipulate memory. Um, and then we do our memory mapping. So here we are mapping our um, virtual base address. So we're doing, we're mapping virtual memory to real memory where the real memory that's getting mapped is the, the base address for the lightweight bus here and for the Axie bus here. So we open this up and I did do a little bit of research about what these parameters are so I can talk about them a little bit. Um, so we M map null, as far as I understand, says put this wherever you want. Um, we, we estimate how much memory we're going to map in units of pages. We allow for reading and writing. Um, we decide whether that memory is shared or not. We give the file ID and then we give the um, actual hardware base which is going to be mapped into virtual space. And then we catch errors, right? which is just good practice. So we do this for the lightweight bus. We do this for the Axie bus. Um, and then we set up our pointers to the memory addresses that are getting mapped to our PIO ports. So these are the two that already existed in the example, and we'd like to add our new PIO port to this list of PIO ports that are getting mapped. So I'm gonna call this, um, I already gave this a name, I called it my PIO read pointer. So my PIO read pointer equals unsigned in star plus our offset, the new PIO read offset from that base address, which we defined here and which agrees with the number that we put into QSYS. Okay. And now everything's mapped. So now we can do normal looking C stuff with this and the, the memory manipulation that we do here in C, we'll be able to see it over on the FPGA side. So what this program is actually doing is nothing tremendously complicated. Um, it asks the user for an input and then it writes that input to the two output PIO ports that go from the ARM to the FPGA. You'll recall that on the Verilog side, we're incrementing each of those and then sending it back over our, um, our input PIO ports. So we put a number in, it gets sent over the output PIO ports. And then here we are just reading back the, the, um, information that's on the input PIO. So I just want to add our new PIO port to this list. So I will say we're going to read back on one additional port and this is going to be, what did I pick? I always forget what I call it. My PIO read pointer. Okay. So now what we expect is we're going to send user input information over the PIO ports. It'll get incremented by one for these two PIO ports, you'll recall in the Verilog. And then we're incrementing our own PIO by two. So if I type in six here, the expectation is that we'll read back seven, seven, eight. So I'm going to, um, copy all of this and put it onto the FPGA and see if it works. 
So let's do this. I'm going to save this file. We'll call it, um, oh, I want to give it the same name, uh, PIO test one.c. So we'll call this and we'll save it in downloads. Okay. So now what we would like to do is move this over to the FPGA, compile it and run it. And since perhaps not all groups have um, necessarily opened a connection to your FPGAs yet, because most everyone's just been working in model SIM, I thought I would just show how you, how you do this. Um, so every PC has the FPGA already hooked up through a, a serial port. So if you open device manager and take a look at your serial ports, we can see that ours is on COM port four. So then if we open a PuTTY um, we, through PuTTY, we can go to COM four and open a 115200 serial connection to COM four. And then we have a terminal access to the FPGA. Um, if we then run IF config, we can see what our you will be able to see what your group's particular IP address for your FPGA is. So in my case, um, it is 10.253.17.24. Um, which allows me if I want to open an SSH connection to that. So 10.253.17.24. Log in as root. The default password here is big red 5760. Uh, I recommend that you change yours. I've changed mine, so folks can't get into this one if, if you try. Okay, so, uh, but we, what we'd like to do is move. So let's see, I'm just gonna make a new directory here it's called Hunter and I'll go into that directory and I'll put our new file in the Hunter directory. So I'm gonna open PSFTP and open a connection to root at 10.253.17.24. I imagine many of you have used this before, but if it's been a long time, maybe it's worth just seeing how this is done. Um, so we can print our, our um, current directory. This is in the FPGA, so I can change to the Hunter directory and then we can print our local directory here, which is not where we wanna be. So I can change this to the downloads folder and then put PIO test 1.c. So now when I go back to the PuTTY terminal, this is now on the FPGA, right? So this is one way of moving files from the lab PC onto the FPGA. Maybe you have other ways that you prefer and that's fine. Um, but let me now, let me now build this. So I will, or compile this rather. Ah. We'll compile with GCC. So GCC PIO test 1.c dash O PIO. So that compiled, that's nice. And we'll run it. So now I will put some input in, let's say three. The expectation again is the two PIO ports that already existed when we started this example incremented by one and the one that we added increments by two. So the expectation is that we should see four, four, five if this is working properly, which is great. Okay, so that's, that is what we see. So what we've demonstrated here is how to set up a PIO port to send information from the FPGA to the arm, which is something that you will have to do for lab one. Um, the other thing that you'll have to do with lab one, which Katie was talking about a little bit at the beginning of lecture is send information from the arm to the FPGA. Um, you'll have to send in initial conditions for the Lorenz equations, and you'll have to send in the parameter values, and then you'll likely be clocking your integrator through one of these PIO ports. So let's augment this just a little bit more. Um, what I want to do is add a, add another PIO port 
from the arm to the FPGA so that you can see how that's done. Any questions so far? Is this useful? Or am I, I hope I'm not wasting your time. Okay, okay. So let's add another PIO port. Hey Hunter, can I ask yeah, a question? For sure. Um, do you, what kind of like recommendations do you have in terms of uh, keeping our like directories organized on our FP, like on our Linux? Should we just do what you did and create a new directory and store all our files there? Or, you know, is, what, how do you suggest we organize our files? So it's, it's entirely up to you. Um, your group sort of owns that SD card. So no one else is going to be competing for space on that SD card. I would definitely recommend creating a different directory for each lab, for example, uh, just to keep things organized. But if you want to just, uh, it's up to you, right? So whatever you would like to do. If it were me, I would make a new directory for each lab. Um, and sometimes if I'm testing things that I know might break, then I make a new directory for that just so I can keep working stuff separate from not working stuff. But again, it's whatever works best. I Any other questions? Too. Yeah. Um, my suggestion is what I, what I do is to leave all my source code, the editable source code on the host machine, in this case, the, the remote desktop machine, the, the PC, and, and then download the code and compile it but, but because CD, uh, SD cards get corrupted fairly easily, you can't predict that anything you write onto an SD card will be there the next time it's that you come in. Not because somebody else trashes it, but because you trash it by accident. Um, so, there it is. the C program. Okay. So um, obviously like it's linked to the FPGA through um, the um, um, I forgot what the thing is called. Um, QSIS? The, um, what's the other way? Like that's not QSIS? Like, DMA? Um, the other direction. I forgot what the... Oh like memory mapping? Or... Oh okay yeah. Yeah sorry. Um, so it's me it's just map through memory. And um, I was just wondering, like, how does this, um, how does the compiler know that, um, I guess, just know to run this on the SPGA? Um, like, um, did the directory you put this C file matter when you were compiling this? The, the directory where I put this does not matter. I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question properly. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Um, I think um, my biggest question was just like, if you're accessing, um, could you basically just create, was there any sort of configuration process involved with like accessing that FPGA or basically does it mean that anytime you access those registers, it'll just, um, you'll be able to just control the FPGA that way regardless of, because I know you like, you um, SSH'd into PuTTY right now, mm -hmm. and um, you connected that way. Um, I guess my question was just like, what was the point of doing that? What was the point of SSHing in via PuTTY? Yeah, instead, instead of just like compiling it through like a local um, bash or something. Oh, I see. So, so are you asking what's the benefit of compiling on the FPGA as opposed to compiling on a host PC and then moving the executable over to the FPGA? Yeah, I think um, I just wasn't sure how exactly, um, like why, why do you have to, why did you have to SSH into it? Like you, you grab the IP address and then you compiled through that. But aren't you already on the remote desktop right now? So I'm using, um, I'm using remote desktop to access the lab PC. Mm -hmm. So remote desktop is giving me an interface to the computer that the PC that's sitting in Philips 238. Right. 
I used SSH to get into the Linux image that's running on the SD card on the, the FPGA board. So the SSH connection is to get from the lab PC where I have remote desktop access into the FPGA board, the ARM and FPGA board. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank and there's a, there's a GCC tool chain on there. So the, the recommended workflow is um, you can do like file editing if you're a lunatic and you want to use something like VI, right? You can do editing of your C code on the arm if you want. Right. Uh, but by far the easiest way to do it is edit the C code on the lab PC using whatever text editor you like, move that over and compile and run it on the, on the arm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Can you put Git on the FPGAs, HPS? I don't know. I haven't tried it. Okay. Hey, Git what? Git. Oh. Should be able to. You want to try it? Sure. <laughs> but my my preferred tool chain was to use Notepad as usual on on the uh, on the PC, and then use MOBA X term as a. Uh, to the transfer files to, 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 to be the interactor with the, with the FPGA. It has a nice file handling capability. Yeah. Okay. Whatever's the, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. I just had another question. Um, so when we compile and run this C program, say we didn't do any of the QSIS setup that we did, but we still, gave it like the proper memory addresses and, and like spaced it out so that there weren't any conflicting addresses. Would this give us, would it give an error if QSIS is not set up properly? So one of the, if, if you attempt to, Bruce, jump in if I get, if I get any of this so wrong. There's a, there's a really easy answer to this. Okay. If you try and read or write from an, an address that doesn't exist, it hangs C, waiting forever for a response. And until you, until you program up addresses in QSYS, they don't exist. Okay. Got it just it. hangs. So, so you can't just like hard code stuff in C and then expect it to work. You have to create the actual memory there, in QSYS. There's no hard code values. Okay. You, er, so I, I think Hunter's talked about this some and probably will talk about it again. And that is, there are a few things which are in hardware. The base addresses are in hardware. Nothing else is fixed. You build it. You don't build it, it's not built. Okay. Got it. If, if you attempt to write memory, the other error that could occur is if you attempt to write memory outside of that memory span that you specify, then you'll get a seg fault. Okay. So that's the other symptom of writing to incorrect memory on the C side. I think the two symptoms will either be C hangs or seg fault. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? It's a lot of moving pieces to this, right? I, I, I find that when I'm working on this, so, so the things you're keeping straight in your head when you're doing this is um, the QSYS, the, the Verilog in which you're manipulate, often you're manipulating things that you've exported from QSYS. And then in C, you're making sure that you have the memory addresses, the offsets from the base addresses that agree with what you've specified in QSYS. Very helpful to have a pencil and paper, actually, when you're doing this stuff. It's, um, it's sort of right for me at the edge of what I can hold in my brain at one time without pencil paper. You can do it without it, but it's, makes, I, I find it makes it a lot easier to just have a notepad next to me to make sure I'm keeping all this stuff straight. What else? Anything else? Okay. Interrupt me if something else occurs to you. 
Um, the next thing that I wanted to do here is add another PIO port that goes in the other direction. And I want to tie that one to actual hardware on the FPGA. So I want to ask for user input, input a number, and then display that number on the LEDs on the FPGA. So I want to show how we might do something like that. Um, likelihood, as usual, of me making a mistake here is approaching 100%, but that's okay. So let's add another PIO port. Um, I'm going to make this 32 bits wide. I want to communicate from the arm to the FPGA. So that's going to be output from the arm. I keep blocking myself with the zoom windows. Okay, finish. So now we have another PIO here. I'm going to call this, oops, uh, I'm going to rename this. I'll call this my other PIO. I'll hook up the clock. I'll hook up the resets. Let's put this on the lightweight master since the other one we did on the Axi master. I'm going to hook this up to the lightweight master. I'm going to export this so that I can manipulate it in Verilog. And then I need to change these memory addresses so that I am not at the same offsets of other things that are on the lightweight bus. So the other things that are on the lightweight bus are this PIO port and this PIO port, which are go from, um, go from zero to F and then one to one F. So let's put this at two to two F. which is the same as the, the same offset as the other PIO port that we added. Why is that okay? We're on a different bus, right? If we had put this on the Axi bus, the same bus that we had put the other PIO port on, we couldn't have this at 2.0 to 2.0F because we'd be at the same location. So we'd put this at a different address to not overlap those two things. But okay, so um, we can generate all the Verilog for this. Do I need anything else? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, so we'll generate all this Verilog. And again, this takes maybe 20 to 30 seconds to do. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the questions in the chat, but I guess like while it's generating, uh, oh, can I sure. ask what the difference is between the Axi bus and the lightweight bus, like uh, on the FPGA side? Yes. So. Um, we talked about this a little bit last time. The key difference between these two things, and, and Bruce can correct me if I get this wrong, is one of communication bandwidth. So how quickly can you send information over one bus versus the other bus? The lightweight bus is capable of carrying less information, less bits per second than the Axi bus. So the lightweight bus is really nice for things like user input. Slow human stuff. Bruce, do you want to add anything to that? That's, that's a good summary. The, uh, <clears throat> I, one thing specifically is the lightweight bus is always 32 bits. And the, and the Axi bus can be up to 128 bits wide. Lightweight bus is up to 32 bits. It could be narrower. You could make, yeah. Right, so when you say it's 32 bits, are you saying that one of these IO ports could potentially just be like from, start from zero to like FF or something like in 32 bits? Is that what you're saying? Yes, it, it means that, um, it means that I can send a value that is up to 32 bits wide through that IO port. Okay. So in integer representation, whatever the maximum integer that could be held by 32 bits, 65, whatever, 5,000, whatever, that, that is sort of the upper limit to how big of a number I can send through decimal representation of a number I can send through that IO port. Okay. What about like the maximum, like from base to end? for the, the lightweight? 
Are you talking about the address range, the address span? Address span, yeah. Because right now we've always kept it at like zero to F, but is that does that have to be the case? Oh, oh, the oh, you're talking about the span of the module. Um, for that, you go to the module uh, data sheet and read it. <laughs> Okay. And you will find that an I.O. port is 16 bytes. Why? Well, four bytes for the input output value, four bytes for the data direction register, and then, and then eight more bytes for uh, bitwise control of interrupts, which you dare not use in Linux. Okay. Um, I have another question. Is there ever a situation where you would connect one of these registers up to both buses? So that would like automatically basically cap like how wide that bus would ever be on the AXI bus because it can be wider. But like, is there ever a situation where like the, you know, your architecture is such that you would want a register that would reg like be, I guess, like logged on both buses? Or is there a way to like, pass things between the AXI bus and the lightweight bus. So are you asking, would you ever sort of click both of these? That is to say, put it on both the lightweight master and the AXI master? Yeah. Try it. Um, because like, if you don't do that, is there ever a situation that like you could pass like values from one bus to the other? I don't know if this, like you would ever want to do that, but if you, let's so say- you you could do it in Verilog. Okay. So let me start by saying I have not, I have not tried putting it on both. I don't actually know what happens. But you just clicked it and it turned red, right? It did. Yeah. Uh, you can't do that. Well, it's because the memory addresses. Oh, you think that's what it is? Let's see if I change this to three. And they have different base addresses, right? So if you try to assign them the same address, they're on different things. So the problem is if you have two masters hooked to the same slave. Oh, you what know what happens? It, it did not allow me to click both. Yeah, I think that's right. Oh, yes, it did. I'm sorry. It, <laughs> <laughs> it did. I can select both. Yeah, so I guess like just the reason why I asked that is because I'm like, like you said, right, like the width of the channel can be different between the two buses. But I was wondering, like, you know, if you ever have an application where like, you have one thing looking at one of the buses and another thing looking at the other bus, but then the two have to work together to like, provide output to some other third thing, then like, would you ever want them to? Yeah. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I see what you're saying. And I think that the logic of the slave input, you know, the, of the slave controller input, is that it is going to respond to one bus, but it cannot respond to both buses. And so it, I doubt that it would work to hook up two masters to the same slave input because the slave input wouldn't know what to respond to. If I wanted to do something like this, the way that I would be inclined to do it is make that connection in Verilog. So I would communicate over one bus, export into Verilog. Oh, okay. In Verilog, I can tie, I can short these two lines right. so that I can then communicate on the other bus. But yeah, okay, I, that, yeah. Yeah, that, so this is basically just saying like what's coming out of the arm into the FPGA. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah I got it, thank you. Now, if you, you can, if you want to do something really twisted, uh, you can write your own QSYS module that has an AXI bus input and a lightweight bus input as two different ports. Uh, don't do that for this lab. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I won't. <laughs> so, okay. Keep interrupting me with questions if you want. Um, but okay, so we've added another PIO port. This one is uh, an output port. We generated the HDL. So if we go back to our Verilog, um, we're going to create a, another wire, our new, new PIO port. I'll, it's 32 bits wide. Oops, always do that. 32 bits wide. I'll call this um, new output port. Um, I am going to get rid of the LED flashing that we were doing before because I want to do other stuff with the LEDs. So let's just get rid of this. And I want to assign LEDR this. That is the out, assign the, um, the LEDs to new output port. to the bottom 10 bits of this PIO port. And then we need to hook this up. So we go look into that computer system file to find the name that QSIS generated. So within here, Verilog, computer system, synthesis, Computersystem.v. We can see the QSIS generated this name for our new PIO port. So I'm going to copy that. Oh. Copy that, and put it here. And paste. And the name that we gave this in our Verilog was new output port. Okay, so let's compile this. And it may or may not throw an error, but while this is compiling, because that's going to take oh, probably about the rest of the time we have, um, let's go back to the C and we may not have the opportunity to actually run this today, but we can at least add what we would need to in here. So we added a new PIO port now to the lightweight bus, which is not this stuff, right? So we want to add a new PIO port here. So I'm going to call this, I'll call this um, lightweight PIO right. Pointer. You can call it whatever you want. Um, just for clarity, oh golly. I'm going to define this again. It's the same thing, right? Because it's the same offset, but just from a different base address but just so that it's readable for me and I can be sure that I'm not making errors, I'm going to define another offset here. Um, and then in the lightweight part of our memory mapping, I'm going to say um, whatever, I, lightweight PIO right pointer is equal to is equal to our base address plus the offset, which we specified in QSIS. Um, and then we are set up. So uh, what I'm going to do is, we asked for user input already. I'm just gonna write that to our new PIO port. So then the expectation is that when we send this over to the FPGA, it will take the bottom 10 bits of that and write, up to, write it to the LEDs. So from zero up to 255, it will, it will write the binary representation of that number. So if I punch in 255, 
the expectation is all 10 LEDs will light up. So let me copy all this and save it here. And then as before, I'm just going to move this over to the FPGA. I'm going to compile. So now we're ready to test as soon as this is finished compiling, which is probably not going to happen in the next three minutes, but that's okay. Um, this is going to be the first thing that we do next time. So, um, I'm not going to get into anything new in the next three minutes. I'm happy to continue to answer questions and we'll see if this compiles. Uh, otherwise, we'll finish this demo next time. Okay. Has anyone started playing with this on your own? Has anyone added PIO ports to an existing design? Um, you can add one of these ports, I will add, to, to any of the existing projects that are on the course website. You can open up the QSYS for that project, plop a PIO port onto that project, and try to get some simple IO running. And that's probably a good place to start, is to do something like this, where you open up an existing design, create a PIO port, tie it to the LEDs or the hex output, and just see if you can punch numbers in and get numbers out. Um, that's gonna get you most of the way to the interaction between the HPS and the FPGA for lab one. What do you guys think? Starting to make a little bit of sense. It'll start to make a lot more sense as you play with it more. Um, but we're going to keep playing with this and start doing more sophisticated things. The next big sort of concept that we're going to talk about in connection with QSYS and, and Verilog is writing bus masters. So one of the modules that's available on this, this library of um, library of IP that you can add to the bus is a bus master, which is something that allows you to manipulate that bus within Verilog. So you could write a bus master to control the VGA output, for example. You can write a bus master to control the audio output um, in lab one, you don't necessarily have to write one of these to control the VGA screen. We're, we're, it's okay if you control the VGA from the HPS for lab one. And in a coming lecture, I'm going to show how that's done. For lab three, you absolutely must write a bus master or write directly to VGA memory, which is something else that we can talk about. Um, but that's what's coming. Okay. Question? We're most of the way there, so I'm not going to end this call until I do this demo. And if you all want to sign off and watch the recording later, that's perfectly fine with me. But Is it possible for you to share the, the C code um, just so that we could try running it in our systems as well? I know we didn't write a lot of code, but um, I know there were some like variables that I want to make sure that I, I didn't miss and stuff like that. Yeah, I can share this. The, the, this is entirely based on, on the course website within the HPS to FPGA communication web page. This okay. C code contains almost everything. So this is where I started and oh, I okay. added a few lines to this. So I'm, I'm very happy to share the modifications that I've made, if that's helpful. But this is really the, the, place, the, the place to start. Okay. Other questions? I have kind of a basic Verilog question about um, connecting like our Verilog code to this like huge um, SOC computer file should we be just like plopping our modules into this giant file or should like can you like connect it to your module into here you mean into this big um this yeah. module here did you just so, put your module at the end or what 
So this is the, the top level module. So if you write a separate standalone module, you would place that outside of the DE1 SOC module and then instantiate it within the top level module. So it depends on if you're writing something like a, golly, how do I want to answer this? Things like state machines that are controlling the FPGA would go directly into the DE1 SOC module. If you, if those state machines are doing combinatoric logic, right, by instantiating other modules, those modules would be instantiated outside of this. We, I can show you examples of how this architecture works in, in the next lecture or something. Yeah, I just mean like so the, so the inputs from the HPS are coming to this file and then we want to send them to like our uh, DDA module. Like should we have that like just like a separate thing, like a lower level module in the project? Probably. So yeah, or Bruce, think what of, do you think? You can think? One way of thinking about this is that, <clears throat> is that the HPS module is embedded in the main module, in the top level module and your modules will also be embedded in that top level module. So they're not inside the HPS module, they're co-equal with it. The top level module acts as the glue that hangs everything together. It, 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 the top level module takes in your, your, your Verilog code and connects it to QSYS. And you can physically put that in a separate file and include it in the project and it'll, and it'll get found, or you can inline it after the main module. But we're calling the function from the main module. We're calling the DDA calling function, function from the main module. Not, you're building hardware from the main module. You're not calling a function. Okay. You're built, yes, you can, you can instantiate a module that you build in the top level module. I'm, I'm getting a blank here. But no, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying, I'm, 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 I'm basically asking like, okay, you get all these variables like to this module and I'm assuming you have to call, like you'd say like, you know, DDA, DUT, and then set, send it from there, right? Two more well, you may have to make a lot of connections in the top level module, but it's, it's connections. So your, your, your computational module is going to be connected by instantiating it in the top level module. Okay. That's what, that's what I was asking. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's what, that's what it is. Okay. And here's the big exciting climax. I can type in 255 and yay, all the LEDs light up. Good job. <laughs> These are the small victories that it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, when I got the PIO working yesterday and I, I typed in five and I got six back, I was like, nice, like a seven. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting moments. <laughs> like magic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will see Monday folks and any other folks that would like to come to lab this afternoon. And otherwise, I will see you Wednesday, if not before. And I'll test that Cordis thing. I'll see if I uh, can get that particular example fired up in Cordis without any errors and get back to all of you. I'll look for a Piazza post in maybe 45 minutes or an hour. Thank you. Yeah.